church, let's stand up together as we get ready for worship. If you're outside eating some snacks, come on in. We're about to worship the Lord together. Here we go. Let's join us in clapping. Come on. And we sing. prayer is that you show us your glory, show us your power in a mighty way. As we take time out of our week, we've set this time aside on Sunday mornings to come to your house and worship you because you're a God who is worthy of all our praise, not only today, but tomorrow and one day as we sing together with the angels. And so, Father, we come before you. We ask that you bless our morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. Good morning, church. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. If you're watching online, thank you for, for logging in and being a part of our worship service here at St. Matthew. We're so glad that you're with us. We're a few weeks away from Easter. Amen. And um, I, was, I, I got to re-watching The Chosen recently. Have you guys are familiar with The Chosen? It's a wonderful um, um, docu-series or, you know, series on the life of Jesus. And I'm reminded at the very first episode that they're setting up the idea that only one can forgive sins. And that is the person that has been wronged. When Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, that was the biggest blasphemy. Because he claimed to be God himself. So not only did he say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It was the fact that he forgave sins that was his crime. But we as believers, we as Christians, we know that we come to the foot of the cross daily. We come before usually when we start worship. We come and ask for forgiveness to the one we've wronged, and that is God our Father. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, we come to you at the foot of the cross and we ask for forgiveness of all our sins. We know that we've fallen short to your glory, but we also have an assurance that because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, our sins are forgiven. So this morning, we repent of our sins, we turn away from them, and we continue to walk with you. Lord, thank you for being the way, the truth, and the life. And so this morning, we are grateful for that. We ask all of these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> through every path, through every heart, through every circumstance, You are my fortress, and you are my portion, and you are my hiding place, and I believe the way, the truth, and the life, and I believe you are the way, the 
Let's all stand up together. Let's move a little bit. Let's greet somebody new. Give them a hug. Give them a, a holy kiss if that's what you're into. Um, and uh, let's go that. All right. We're done. All right. Good. And we want to welcome the kids to come on down. Children, come on down for our children's message. So if you're a child or act like a child, come on down. Hi guys, how you doing? Are you are you awake? Are you focused? Let's go. One, two, three. Woo! Ready? One, two, three. Woo-hoo. All right, cool. Hey, I brought this uh, this letter I got this week, and it, it it is addressed to me. Someone actually wrote it in their own handwriting. Pastor Brad Kassan. See that? Pastor Brad Kassan. It's to me. This thing is whatever this is. It's to me personally. And you open it up, and it's an invitation. Isn't that cool? It's an invitation to a wedding. It says, save the date. I'm pretty important. They want me there. It says, save the date. And I get to go to a place called La Review Estate. Whoa, baby. La Review Estate. Isn't that awesome stuff? We'll do a wedding. You know, when I did my son's wedding uh, uh, and, and his wife, uh, uh, we had some people do the food. Actually, the guy that played right back here, he and his wife did, did the food. Chris and Dodger, they, they still talk about the food more than they talk about the wedding. I wonder if they're going to have good food at La Review Estate, huh? Because you always get a feast at these weddings. I get to go because I got an invitation. You know, the things about that is that not everybody gets an invitation, so not everybody gets to go, right? Have you ever gotten an invitation? Have you got an invitation like to a party, a birthday party, or to do this or that? Yeah, you got invitations. Yeah, not everybody gets to go. You got to have an invitation. This is what I want you to remember today. Remember? Okay? Jesus gives an invitation to every single one of us. And his table is big enough for all of us. That's about what the Bible says. Jesus told this story. He says there was this guy, and it was his dad, his heavenly father. He says, yeah, he gave an invitation to everybody. And it didn't matter whether you had fouled up or whether if you weren't part of this group or part of that group. He gave an invitation to everybody so that everyone could be part of the, could come to the party and have this great feast with him every single day because he's with us every single day, right? And we can be his people and finally forever. Isn't that cool stuff? 
And here's the deal. He not only gives us an invitation, he says, now listen, listen, I want you to make sure everybody knows that they're invited. That means you're invited, and 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 you're, all of us are invited to live with Jesus, and we get to invite others to come along with us. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, thanks for the invitation. We get to live with you now and forever. We get to be at your table, at the feast, forever. We pray, help us to invite others. Pray in your name. Amen. All right, guys, we'll see you uh, next week. We got, children's sermon, uh, we got children's church right out there. Somebody, is there, some, is there somebody? Wave your hand. Uh-oh, we got somebody there? Uh-oh. Some, somebody help them, guy. I don't see, we think we have, Ron's going to do it. All right, very good, Ron, Ron's going to do it. All right. I, you know, I never was good at looking before I leaped. Maybe that was my problem. I'm Brad, I'm one of the pastors here. It's great to be with you. Uh, whether we're here in person or online, God's not bound by space and time. The Spirit touches our hearts and gives us his gifts uh, as we're in his word. And so I know that God's spirit will touch your heart and give you his gift. And I pray that you might receive that gift uh, just in the place you are in your life, uh, in just the way uh, that, that you need to receive it. Uh, God's going to bring that to you. Amen? Yeah, amen. All right, so this is our, our series, Good, good News Me, and, and the, the idea here, of course, is that God brings us good news in Jesus, and, and today is a place at the table, a place at the table. Ah. So my fr- first day of my sophomore year of high school, uh, I was going to, to choir. I had tried out uh, the, the, my freshman year, and I made it, probably because not many guys tried out. I mean, let's be honest, right? So, but I, I, I made the choir, and it was third period. I was having a good day. I don't know about you, but I always got hungry in high school. And so uh, between second and third period, I always bought a lemon, uh, a hostess lemon fruit pie. Right? Woo, that was good stuff. And, and so I, I jammed that down. You know, that, that was when I didn't have to be careful how fast I ate. And I jammed that thing down, and I drink some water. And I'm, so I'm going there. I'm going to be on time, but just by a couple minutes, right? There's like a seven-minute passing period. That's pretty good. Buy a lemon, lemon hostess fruit pie, a le- lemon, of course, and, and, and smack it down, get water, and still get there with two minutes to spare. That's pretty good, right? So I, I, wa- <laughs> I walk in the, in, in the choir room. And I don't know if you've ever done that, but it's this huge room. And it's got risers. I would say it was almost as big as a stage, right? And, and, and you had like 60 kids up there. And they were chattering away. They were all there. Uh, like I said, I was there, but a little late. And, and I walked through the door, and all of a sudden, everything goes silent. And I got 60 pairs of eyes looking at me. And they didn't want me there. I mean, the eyes were like, whoa. I mean, it maybe. I want to take a step back, you know, and I just kind of froze, and I'm thinking, whoa, did I do something wrong, and I realized, no, I, I didn't do anything wrong, and then I'm, I'm starting to get the idea, I am wrong, those eyes are saying, I don't belong here, and, and there was this frozen moment, and I'm almost turning around, you know, you don't have to take choir, right? And I'm thinking, all right, if 60 pairs of eyes say I'm not, I don't belong here, I'm not supposed to be here. And just about the time I'm going to turn, out, turn around and drop the thing, you know, this one guy comes down out of the risers. It's still just deathly quiet. He comes down out of the risers, sticks his hand out, and he says, hi, I'm Jim. It's good to meet you. All of a sudden, I belong. Maybe not to all these people, but I belong with him, right? I was talking with uh, uh, P- Pastor Nathan between the services, and he was saying as he was uh, listening to this uh, message the first time, he says, you know, it really struck me that we can't make ourselves part of a group. If we're shut out, we can't make our, it takes somebody else to do that. That's what Jim did with me that, that day. He good news me in a sense, not, not with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he good news me, right? I was, I was pushed out. I was canceled. They turned, in a sense, turned their backs on me. It, it, that, that's called shaming. I, 
wasn't supposed to be part of this group. You know, as, as I've thought through that, you, even that, I, I couldn't figure out what was going on. And, and, and looking back, I think, well, maybe because everybody else were juniors and seniors, and they looked down at me because I was a, a sophomore. That, that, I, maybe that was it. Um, maybe because we did different things with our lives. You know, I spent a lot of time in the gym, and, and these guys didn't do that. And, and so maybe, or, or maybe it was because I was on the wrong side of the tracks. And mo- most of the folks in the choir, they grew up near the country club. And that, that wasn't my district, right? I don't know. All I know is that those eyes said, you don't belong here. There's something wrong with you. You can't fix that. You can't fix it if there's something wrong with you. And Jim changed all that. Because he came out and he said, you're with me. Good news to me, that's... That's the, uh, the series theme, and it comes from the Greek word orangelia, means, which is a word for gospel, right? The good news of Jesus Christ, as it, as it comes to us, as it affects us in our lives, in every way that sin has fouled us up, the good news of Jesus meets us in that place. We, we've talked about this, but I, I, I always like to kind of set the table a little bit. So, so we, we, we've talked about the, the types of cultures we have, and, and of course, it's all a mixture in every culture, but we've talked about the fear and power culture. Uh, um, the idea here is that we're afraid. We are, aren't we? We're afraid of so many things, and we try to get power over those things. We try to get power over death. Oh, what did he die of? Oh, diabetes? Oh, good, I don't have that, man, I'm good. Uh, you're still going to die, pal, right? We try to get power over death and, and sickness. Oh, what are they? Oh, he smoked three packs of cigarettes? I'm not going to get lung cancer. See, we always try to think we have power over things. We, we, we try to do that uh, by, by being, by, by in our own strength, or who we tie ourselves to, or in a thousand ways. And finally, what it comes down to, we don't have power over anything. And we're afraid of that. Jesus says, all power has been given to me in heaven and earth. And I'm with you. And, and the guilt, innocence culture, this is the one we're most familiar with. It, I, I, I think this culture is changing, but it used to be the dominant of the three in our cultures. The idea that, that I have done something wrong, so I have to make up for it. I am guilty. We all know that, right? We talked about that last week, how we bear guilt Huh? And we can't fix it. And so Jesus comes and takes his, our guilt on himself at the cross. We're washed clean in the blood of Christ. And we like that. We're, we're familiar with that. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but did you know that there's only two types? You can check me out on this, okay? Go ahead and read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John this week and check me out. I think there's only two places where Jesus actually turns to an individual and says, your sins are forgiven. Check me out. That, I'm not trying to diminish the idea that your sins are forgiven. But I am saying that there's more to the good news of Jesus as sin has touched our life than just telling us our sins are forgiven. Even the prodigal son, he's going to go say to his father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. I'll just let him be a servant. And his dad doesn't let him even get it out of his mouth. He just restores his honor. He just puts the ring on his finger. He takes his shame away. That's what we're going to talk about again today. The shame and honor culture, the idea that, that not I did wrong, but I, I am wrong. And how we, we sometimes tell ourselves that, and we cover it up with a veneer, and, and, sometimes, other tells our, and sometimes others tell us that. And I, I really think that we're more and more becoming a, a shame and honor culture, uh, I, I mentioned this the last couple of weeks, but it's really struck me. Uh, are, are you a Democrat or Republican? Whatever you are, whoever is part of your tribe, they can do no wrong. They can do things that you know are morally wrong, but they're part of my tribe, so I'll defend them to the death. Isn't that right? It doesn't matter which side you're on. You react the same way. And the other guys, no matter what they do, they're wrong. No matter what they do. It's not that they do something right or wrong. It's just that they are wrong. And, and, and I'm really, uh, as I've thought about this, I, I'm so concerned for our young people because they live in this world that is tied to honor and shame and, and there's nothing they can do or not do. 
if they are shamed by a group, if they are canceled by a group, it's not a thing you jump through a hoop and everything's good again. You're all alone. See, that's the thing with a shame and honor culture. It has to do with groups and tribes. And if you're not part of our group, we, we turn our faces away from you. We shame you and we cancel you. Those of us who, who grew up uh, in, in another time, we, we're, we're still that guilt, innocence thing. And, and even in the face of this, we can say, wait a minute, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm good. But our young people, they are at risk here. And we need to know that so we can bring into their lives these open arms that receive them and say, you're part of my group. You're part of the people of God. Not because you've done anything, but by grace. Where in our lives do we cancel people and shame people and do that to our young people? And, and where do we let the voices tell, our, tell us that we, that we are shamed? Where do we tell ourselves that? The good news of Jesus steps into this to give us an honor that doesn't come from ourselves, but outside of ourselves. So it's absolutely certain and sure. Our uh, story today uh, begins like this, one Sabbath. Now, there's so much to that idea, one Sabbath. Sabbath was a day that the, the, the people of God, the people of Israel worshiped, right? And it was on Saturday, and it was meant to be a day of rest for all the people of God. It was meant for them to come together, celebrate together as the family of God. One Sabbath. So this was a Sabbath day meant to bring everybody together, all of God's family, right? When Jesus went to eat uh, in the house of a, fair, of a prominent Pharisee. Now, what's going on here? Well, the, the, the Pharisees were, were, were the leaders of the people. They had lots of bucks. And so they would prepare for, for these Sabbath things, for these Sabbath days. And they'd have feasts on these days. They'd prepare the day before, or maybe even the day before that. And they'd have all this feast, all this food ready to go, and they'd kind of have an open house. And anybody could come to the open house. You could drift in or out after all. It's the Sabbath, right? And it's for all of God's people. But only those who were invited to the table could eat. It was an us and them. And if you didn't measure up with us, you're the them. That's what's happening here. That's the context. He went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee. Of course, he's being watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from drops. He had, he, he was, uh, uh, he had swelling all over his body. Uh, and so you could tell that, that he was sick. And there was something wrong. And of course, at that time, if you were sick and had something wrong, God must have it out for you. We're the, we're the, we're, we're the right ones because we're not sick. You, there's something wrong with you. So he hadn't been invited to the table. He wasn't one going to the feast. It was an us and them. They would turn their heads away from him. They would shame him. There's something wrong with you. It wasn't that you're sick and so we can make you better. It's like there's something wrong with you, pal. You don't belong with us. That's the context here. That's an honor-shame culture. You ever felt that in your life? Have you ever done that to somebody else? As I, I mentioned, I think, if you don't take anything else with you today, think about how we sometimes do this to children, uh, to young adults, and how we can be a better voice in their lives. But we can all relate, right? We've had this done to us. And we've taken it into ourselves at times that, yeah, there's something wrong with me. And we've done it to others. That's what's going on here. Jesus is going to talk to this. He's going to free us from this. So it begins like this. Uh, Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Taking hold of the man, he healed him, sent him on his way. In other words, he restored his honor, sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? What is he doing here? He's showing them that they're crazy. 
that they're far from wisdom. You mean, you, you mean this guy, you're going to remain silent? You don't want me to heal him. Why? Because he's out here. He's, he's dishonored. He's not part of us. Oh, no, don't heal him. But you know, as sure as shooting, that if it was your son in that well, if it was your son with dropsy, you want me to heal him. See, this whole section, I know it's a little longer section that we're looking at today, but I wanted to look at it in its entirety. This whole section, Jesus is trying to rescue us from what sin has done to us in this area of our lives. And, and, and with the, the Pharisees, he's, he's pointing out how ridiculous their stand is. Just because of what group you belong to depends on whether you want me to heal them or not? Foolishness. Of course, we'd never do that, right? And we would never think that somehow the healing wasn't for me because there's something wrong with me. I was reading this last week uh, about what some folks have written about this shame, honor uh, section of our uh, culture. And it says, as descendants of Adam, we inherit their original shame. What was that original shame? Well, now think about it. They were created in the image of God, right? Uh, and and uh, Satan comes to them and says, you're going to be like God's. Is that what they said? You're going to be like God. And so they exchanged the honor that God gave them for a counterfeit honor. That's what they did. And ever since that day, they've been looking to restore honor to themselves. They forfeited divine honor to pursue self-earned honor. What's so interesting is what's the first, you may not remember this, but what's the first thing they do? They sow fig leaves over their nakedness. They try to cover their shame. How do you try to cover your shame? Even as you read through Genesis, right after the flood, right? You have this the, the, these people groups that are now multiplying. What's the first thing that's recorded? They they're going to build a tower to heaven, right? And you know, what, you know why they're going to do that? Let's make a name for ourselves. Go check me out on that. Go read it out. Let's make it. Let's find honor in ourselves. This goes on. Then our own uh, d defiled and disloyal heart increases shame. This shame, this shapes our identity and our behavior. Where do you look for honor in your life? Maybe in what you can accomplish. Maybe in what power you can wield. Maybe in how much stuff you can accumulate. Maybe in the house you buy. Maybe in the person you can marry. Where do you look for honor in your life? All of those things are blessings from God. But our honor comes from who we are in Jesus Christ. It's the only place and everything else just doesn't work. And it's a lie. This guy goes on, he, he continues, he says, sin is largely the false attempt to cover shame and fabricate honor. We manufacture a false status, often by shaming others or boasting in the superiority of our group. Having lost our spiritual face, family, name, and status, our life is a perpetual effort to construct a, read the last two words, a, wow, this is us, isn't it? And we're always looking working to, to this, put this counterfeit honor on like, like armor, and it's never enough. It's never enough. The only place that this honor can be restored is in Jesus Christ. What does it say about him, what does it say about him going to the cross? Go ahead, put that up for me. For the joy set before him, he endured this cross, scorning its, read the word, shame. You see, he took our shame on himself at the cross. How do you do that? The father turned his face from him. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That should have been our shame. His friends ran away from him. Should have been our shame. His enemies made fun of him. Should have been our shame. He took our shame on the cross the joy 
of giving us his honor. In Isaiah 53, it says this, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. We're ashamed of him. We don't want to look at him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. He's not part of us. But then it says this, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows yet we considered him smicken, stricken by God stricken by God and afflicted the very thing we want to turn away from was what he took of ours on the cross counterfeit places that we look for honor none of them will work but in what Jesus gives us the group that he would make us a part of. It's sure and certain and forever. I've called you by name. You're mine. Oh, what manner of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. For you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people belonging to God. This is what our first parents lost. They were created in the image of God and it says after they turned away from him and looked for honor elsewhere, their children were born in their image. But Jesus comes. He restores our image. He gives us his honor we're now part of his group. There's a place at the table for us, for me, for you. That's how this good news meets us in our brokenness. As we long to be what we were made to be and we look in all the wrong places. Jesus comes and restores that. I have called you by name. You are mine. Oh, what manner of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. You are a people belonging to God. So this story continues. When Jesus noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. And now, a parable, it's defined in the easiest way is, is, is a, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So the text tells us right away that Jesus calls this a parable even though he's talking to them about what they're doing and that there's a heavenly meaning to it all. And he says, you know, when you come, you look for the most honorable places of the table to sit at. But when you do that... Someone may come and say, hey, pal, you don't belong here. You belong farther away from the place of honor. Kind of like, have you ever been to a, a baseball, not that I would ever do this, but you ever been to a baseball game and, and you got tickets for the bleachers and you try to sit somewhere else and somebody catches you? Not that I would ever do that, right? <laughs> yeah. That's what he says happens here. And he says, don't, so don't do that. Don't try to find a place of honor that you don't belong in. Sit down here. And then someone will exalt you. So what's the heavenly meaning to this? He says those who are humble will be exalted. What does it mean to be humble? It means to give up the honor that we would look for and try to make up for ourselves. All the counterfeit stuff. Give that up. And receive the honor that Jesus gives and you will be exalted. And then he slides into telling them uh, how they should act when they give a banquet of their own. Go ahead. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends. When you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Remember this whole section is, is on how sin has distorted us. 
And we have all these ways that we look for our lost honor in counterfeit ways. And, and one of the ways is that we'll, we'll, we'll uh, invite our friends. We'll invite these people we want to be connected to. Well, all these ways so that we're honored. He says, no, 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 no. To be humble is to give all that up. And instead, invite those who are hurting, those whom you can treat as Jesus treats you and restore their honor and say, you belong here with me. And when you do that, you'll be blessed. Where can you do that in your life? You know, sometimes it's, it's in the relationships that are closest to us. Sometimes we treat our husband or wife as if, as if, there's something to be ashamed of. As if they really shouldn't be tied to me. Sometimes we do it with our children. What's the matter with you? Sometimes we have others do it to us. Certainly, it's concentric circles out beyond that. But let's start with those who are closest to us. Sometimes with all these things, all this invitation about Jesus, we, we self-exclude ourselves because somehow we believe the cacophony of voices, that's hard to say, cacophony of voices that tell us we don't belong. Finally, one of the guys there, he recognizes, hey man, Jesus, he's just not talking about what's happening here and now. He must be talking about the kingdom of God. And he says, when one of these, those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And all of a sudden, ding, 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 the lights go on and one guy gets it. Jesus isn't talking about this feast. He's not trying to, to like hit me in the chops because he wants all these guys invited. No, no, no. He's talking about heaven, man. He's talking about the feast of the kingdom. There's something more going on here. It hits him. Jesus tells a story. He answered, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. And the guests gave excuses, one after another. Go ahead, put them all up for me. I just bought a field. I just bought five yoke of oxen. I just got married. What's he saying there? What are they saying there? This is where my honor is, baby. I don't need to come to your stinking feast. I just bought a field. Look how rich I'm going to be. Oh, yeah. Look at this. I got oxen, baby, five yoke of them. Man, I've got, see, the honor is what I make of myself. I just got married. You ought to have seen the babe I just married. Huh? That's where my honor is. I just bought a house, baby. I just got this great job. Man, look how much money I've amassed. Look how powerful I am. Look what I've done. Look at me. Look how holy I am. And it goes on and on and on and on. No humbleness there. They all said no. And so this rich man, he's, this big feast, he says, go out quickly to his servants into the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And it still wasn't filled, so he says, go out to the roads and the lanes so my house will be full. You know, a lot of people, they, they read this story and they think that, that Jesus, that, that Jesus uh, is having his heavenly father here invite all these other folks because the first folks didn't want to come in. I, I think that's a, a, mis, a misreading here. I, I think the reading is that there's always room for one more. There's always room at the table. Those folks that didn't come in, they, if they ever turned away from that and came to the feast, they'd be, they'd be welcome. Welcome until the very last day. Huh? You're invited. Your honor restore you meant to be part of the kingdom that's what Jesus is trying to say you are the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame and so am I you're the ones that don't measure up so am I you're the one who has the shame that you can't fix and so am I. 
you're the one for whom Jesus took the shame on himself at the cross. And so am I. You're the one who's invited. This invitation and an honor that transcends anything else on the face of this earth. An honor to live in now and to receive into eternity. When Jesus was talking to, um, to the scribes and Pharisees and telling them to invite folks, uh, uh, those who are hurting and the poor and the sick and the lame, he says, you'll be rewarded. And then he says this, all that they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. You know, in this series, we, good news to me, it's, it's about not only receiving, but, but to take it in the lives of others. What, what do you think the repayment will be. It says about Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. I think it's the same joy for us. The joy of having folks in eternity who are there because of you. We talk about sharing life and creating friendships, inspiring hope. We'll have these friendships in the family of Jesus for an eternity. That's pretty good repayment, what do you think? Guy wrote this, uh, Jesus became a lowly human being in order to save people from shame. His miraculous healings and radical table fellowship restored dignity and honor to marginalized people. Jesus was so full of divine honor that those who touched him became cleansed and accepted. Remember the woman who touched his garment? She was healed. For teaching, his teaching proclaimed the true code of honor. By loving and accepting all people regardless of their reputation, Jesus undercut society's false honor code and offered divine honor to all of humanity. This is a gift that he gives to you and to me and through us to those we can touch as well. Go ahead. Good news, me. <laughs> Your honor is restored. You have a place at the table. It doesn't matter what any other voice says. The voice of Jesus rings true. Is there someone you can share that with? Even as you receive it? Amen. Would you pray with me? Dearest Jesus, we praise your name. You took time uh, to connect with these uh, Pharisees who, who, were, who were just locked into this, um, just like chains around them uh, as they sought their own honor and shamed others. We pray, Lord, that you would rescue us. We might receive the honor you give us as your dear children and that we might live in this freedom uh, that opens our arms as wide as yours on the cross. Pray in your name. Amen. I invite you with a, a time of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made us part of your family, that you have adopted us and welcomed us by your grace that you sent Jesus to earth to, to bring those who couldn't find their way home back to you. You've promised us that what we suffer, when we suffer, that does not condemn us, but instead it is an opportunity for your glory to be displayed in us. And so, Lord, we ask that you would sustain us, especially those of us who are, are suffering in, in body or soul or mind, that you would 
pour out your spirit upon us, that you would strengthen us, that you would heal us by your grace and by the people that you place in our lives. Gracious Lord, you've made us part of your family and invited us to come to you and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We know it's not a temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we prepare uh, to come to this meal, let's take a moment and confess our faith. Our faith in this God that acts and works in our world. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You know, whenever I, I read the creed, whenever I confess the creed, I hear that last phrase of that second part of it. Uh, this Jesus is going to come the, to judge the living and the dead. And I can't help but feel a little bit of fear in me. Like there's something in me that doesn't measure up. And it's interesting as we confess that before we come to the altar because in a way that's true. But it's not about me measuring up. It's about the grace of Jesus. It's about God looking at me and seeing Jesus. And if we come to this table doubting, Jesus is saying to our hearts, you are my child, you are forgiven. When my father looks at you, he sees me and what I've done for you. You belong. And that's why Jesus instituted this meal for us. So that we could be encouraged, so that we could be strengthened, so that we could know that we belong to the family and that his grace is for us. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave to them all, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Our Lord's table is ready for us to come and receive his body and his blood, the bread and the wine, to know that we are forgiven, to receive his forgiveness and be strengthened for life as his people. Please be seated. The ushers will usher you forward in just a moment to come and receive the bread and the wine. After you've received both, uh, you can return to your seats and there'll be a general dismissal. Also during this time, if you uh, need prayer, we have uh, people at the prayer banners just over here on this side it looks like today. Maybe there'll be, one, there'll be one over there in a little bit, and they'd love to pray for you if there's anything going on in your life that we can join you in praying for. Hidden glory in creation, now revealed. 
may this, the body and blood of Jesus, that you have received with your hands and tasted with your lips, strengthen and preserve you, body and soul, unto life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Please have a seat. Got a couple of announcements for you as we wrap up today. I uh, want to make you aware of a couple of things that are coming up right around the corner here. Oh, an offering moment first. Thank you, Marco. Um, we, uh, we continue our service, um, responding to God's grace in our lives. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to recognize that every good gift that we have, everything uh, that we have in our lives is, is a gift from Him. And sometimes we can have everything in the world and not enjoy it. This is one of the steps that we as, as God's people can take that helps us, allows us to enjoy the good gifts that he's given us because we recognize their gifts and we receive them with thankfulness. And so as we come in this time to give back a little bit to what's, what is God's, to him, uh, we ask that he would help us in offering not just what we give this morning but also our whole lives. They would recognize that every breath we take, every morning we wake up, every uh, sunrise and every one that God has placed in our lives as a gift, that we might live in a way that gives honor and glory to him and shows his love and his grace in the world. And so in this time of offering, I invite you to offer not just what you give to God in terms of offering, but your whole life, that God would be at work in your heart and shaping it uh, to look more like his. Uh, there's a few different ways that you can give. You can give uh, on you as you exit on the way out uh, in the boxes, or you can give online by going to stmatthewrockland.com slash give, or you can text an amount to 84321, or uh, you can mail it to us if you're joining us online, and that is also the address on the screen there uh, for where you can find us. We'd love to meet you, hang out with you, meet you in person. I invite you to join me in a word of prayer as I pray for these offerings this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks give you thanks for all that you give us. Lord, we ask that you would help us to recognize your good gifts with a thankful heart, that we may enjoy the things that you've given us and that we would be thankful. Lord, we ask that you would bless these offerings that we give this morning for use in your kingdom, that you would translate them, transform them into more people worshiping you and calling upon your name. In the name of Jesus, Amen. All right, a uh, couple of announcements. Uh, if you're new here this morning, um, welcome. So glad that you're here. I'm Nathan. I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here, and uh, it is a blessing to be here, and we are so glad that you've taken time on a Sunday to be with us. Uh, if you're that first guest here, if, or if this is the first time you feel comfortable meeting some of us, uh, go to the welcome table, and we've got a gift for you. We'd love to welcome you in person, uh, get to know your name. Uh, high school ministry is happening right after worship. They're having uh, nachos this morning. And with that, um, Rebecca DePort, would you come up and uh, say a couple words? We, um, Matt, as you guys know, we commissioned him to go off and be the vice president of LCEF uh, at the district. And so um, we were in the process of looking at an intern. And so this is the director of the DCE program at Concordia Irvine. And she is checking us out to see if uh, we're a good fit for any of... Uh, the future DCEs. That's right. Thank you, Pastor Nathan. Actually, I'm checking out to see if he's a good fit <laughs> for an intern, right? And I mean, we know Pras Pastor Brad c cuts the cuts it all right. <laughs> we got to really check this guy out. But yes, thank you. Uh, part of this visit is just to really see what St. Matthew's is all about and what type of people you are in the community and your ministries that you have here and which of our student graduates would be the best fit to spend a year on an internship. It's really more like a residency because they've completed all their coursework and they need to actually just be put in a place that com is asking to partner with us to say we'd like to be that laboratory, that place for a student to really get their boots on the ground uh, beyond field work and actually be that point of contact, that actual DCE for their DCE certification in our church body. So thank you for applying to partner with us at Concordia Irvine and for you to be one of the many churches that I'm prayerfully uh, considering and discerning which would, be a which would be a best fit for one of our graduates. So I would love to meet you. I would love for you to come and tell me um, a little bit about why you love St. Matthew and why this would be a great teaching church for the next generation of church workers. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have as well. So please find me and um, 
thank you for welcoming me here today. Thank you. So I'm, I'm pretty excited uh, about the possibility of having an intern um, and the idea that, uh, you know, they're generally people that were like me, that volunteered in high school in youth ministry, that volunteered in college. And so we're getting somebody that's got some experience and some fresh ideas, somebody that's young and passionate, but somebody that also needs to experience grace. And I really think that this would be a good place for an intern. Yes, I'm making my case here. Um, <laughs> because we are a church body that's full of grace, and they need that from us as they uh, learn the ropes and grow as a, a leader in God's church in this place. All right, a couple of other announcements as we wrap up. Uh, Want to make sure you guys are aware of the cantata. If you guys went to the Christmas concert, it was fantastic. We're doing it again Monday, Thursday, uh, a cantata called Colors of Grace. It's an opportunity to experience the passion of Jesus in music, uh, song, and narration. It's going to be fantastic, and so I want you to mark that. Along with all the other Holy Week stuff that's going on, you can either check it out on the Thursday Blast that was sent out uh, on Thursday, hence Thursday Blast, or you can uh, get the flyer that's at the welcome table that has everything listed out uh, that's coming up, including the extravaganza, which is an opportunity to invite the community to come and check us out, be a part of what we do here, and maybe experience a little bit of what this community is like that they might encounter Jesus and want to come back and be part of his family here in this place. Also, uh, Wednesday nights, uh, we've got a couple more uh, Advent Wednesday services. Uh, the soups have been fantastic, and I learned a lesson. One week we had, I think, five uh, split pea and hams. It's great <laughs> soup, but that's a lot of split pea and ham, and if you don't like split pea and ham, you're kind of out of luck. So now there is a sign up there where you can list the soup, and so if you see five split pea and hams, bring something else. It's that easy. Uh, you can sign up at the welcome table. We'd love to have you be a part of that. Usually we have life groups that are, uh, get together and say, hey, we want to do it this week. And so this next week we got a lot of spots still available. We'd love to have you serve and help out. It's a great time to hang out. Also, we have youth of stuff happening on Wednesday night. We have uh, Club 56 happening from 5.30 to 7.30 as well as Head to Heart. That's our confirmation uh, preparatory thing. And they're winding down now, so keep them in your prayers as they're putting together their professions of faith uh, leading up to their confirmation on Palm Sunday weekend. So... Very cool stuff. Uh, with that, I get out of the way because you're doing Let's the blessing. Let's all stand Please together. Stand. Here we go. We'll sing our benediction this morning. The Lord bless you.